Sanctity of Life Sunday, but it will happen next week, Lord willing. And uh, so uh, that will be kind of like a, a little ice cream on the top of a cake, you know, next week. So turn back to Psalm 71. I want to make mention of the music seminar. We, Within choir, we've been talking about the Bauman's coming to help us, uh, helping us uh, <laughs> be better uh, with our singing and our music. And those of you who are in choir understand what I'm talking about now. Uh, they're doing much better, but the Bauman's, we can take you this far. Bauman's can take you real far. And uh, so they're going to come. How long we'll be here that Saturday, and uh, and we'll certainly be here for regular practice on Sunday and after that. But they're going to help us with songs that we're going to be doing for a mini cantata for Easter, but also try to help us with just some other stuff too. And we'll hopefully be singing that Sunday also, uh, with something that they have prepared for us. But how long we'll be here on Saturday? sing or like to sing at all or do special music, I think it would be uh, wise of you to be there also uh, for the for that day. So try to clear your schedule for that weekend. I know that's uh, Valentine's Day. Anything else? It's open to anyone and everybody. Okay. Yeah, as long as, you know, even your children, as long as they can sit here and listen, it will be a great value for them. Okay? talk about a little bit about praise today and uh, praising God is uh, what the gifts he's given us is a wonderful wonderful thing and uh, we should all be involved in that uh, okay all right Psalm 71 Psalm 71 let me get there you're already there you beat me Psalm 71 let's finish out the rest of the psalm we'll start at verse 12 though Psalm 71 12 O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let, let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will con hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and the power to everyone that is to come. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God, who is like unto thee? Thou which has showed me great and sore trouble shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I will also praise thee with the psaltery even thy truth, O my God, unto thee will I sing with the harp. O thou, Holy One of Israel, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. In my soul, which thou hast redeemed, my tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long. For they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you and thank you for life. Lord, and for uh, some of us here today, and, and hopefully for all of us, long life, long and prosperous and blessed life, knowing and praising you. Lord, as we sang today, we know that will not stop, but only continue when we pass through this veil and see you face to face. Lord, because you are our redeemer, you are our joy, our strength. And we thank you and praise you for that. I pray, Lord, that we would leave today with a better sense, a better re, uh, respect, and a 
greater appreciation for the elderly in our lives. And Lord, we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It is written in Genesis 1.27, So God cre created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, he, in, he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Psalm 139, 13 through 17, God says this, and through David, David says this, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in the book are all my members were written, which in continuous were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. Sanctity. Sanctity is the quality or state of something being holy or sacred. Life, human life, while we have breath, is of great worth in the sight of God, who gave it, and he alone can take it away. There is great sacredness and dignity to every human life in the sight of God, and thusly it should be in our sight also. Every living soul in Adam has value, no matter how short or how long they may live. Now, when we talk elderly today, we won't be talking Methuselah elderly, will we? None of us will attain to 969 years on the face of the earth. And no matter how they choose to live life in the sight of God, it is still valuable and dignified and sanctified in his sight. You understand that? We have no right, as in no right, to terminate any life because it does not have value in our sight. Whether that is a newborn, whether that is an unborn newborn, or someone who is in their 90s, or the blessedness I get to see, some in their hundreds, they're still valuable in God's sight. Since January 13th, 1984, when President Ronald Reagan issued a proclamation designating the first National Sanctity of Human Life Day, to be January 22nd. Keep that date in mind. Since then, churches on the third Sunday of January have observed Sanctity of Human Life Sunday as a day to remember the intrinsic value of all human life in commemoration of the Supreme Court's decision to legalize abortion in our country. Roe v. Wade landmark decision on January 22nd, 1973 in which state laws prohibiting abortions were declared unconstitutional based on an alleged right to privacy hmm, of the mother, not <laughs> to the unborn, right? Uh, the right to privacy in the due process clause of amendment, the 14th Amendment of our Constitution. Every year in our world, there are, are 40 to 50 million abortions. And then since our law in Road v. Wade 
1973, legalizing the practice of abortion, there have been over 55 million abortions performed in the United States. Approximately 3,000 a day. That's an atrocity. It is an atrocity grander in scale than Jewish holocausts. The plaintiff in the case, Norma McCorvey, is still alive today. She is now a Christian and a pro, an avid pro-life advocate. In our country, nearly half of the pregnancies are unintended. Catch this one. And four out of every 10 cases of pregnancies in the United States are terminated in abortion, 40%. 22% of all pregnancies in the United States, excluding miscarriages, are terminated by abortion. That's appalling. This Sanctity of Life, Human Life Sunday, I could speak about all the ill and all the atrocity of this national sin of abortion. And you know what? I shall again someday. But today I would like to look on the other side of the spectrum of life, and that is our society's growing lack of respect and dignity for the elderly. It has been said the measure of the righteousness of a people or a nation is revealed in how they care for those who cannot care for themselves, which includes the very young and the very old. If that was the standard of the United States on how we care for the young and the very old, uh, I think we'd all agree we've slipped way short of the mark that God would have for us. In, Amer in America, laws legalizing assisted suicide or phys uh, physician's aid in dying, this is what you may hear the new term, they call it PAD, P-A-D, physician, physician aid in dying are on the rise. The practice of euthanasia are legal and practice in several states, including Washington, Oregon, Montana, Vermont, and New Mexico, five of our states. Dr. Jack Kevorkian, author of Between the Dying and the Dead, an advocate of euthanasia, has many disturbing quotes, trivializing life and uh, he seems to be the standard of, of this practice, more commonly known as Dr. Death himself. Let me give you a few quotes from him. Dying is not a crime. If you don't have liberty and self-determination, you can get you got you've got nothing. That's why what this is is what this country is built on. And this is the ultimate self-determination when you can determine how and when you are going to die when you suffer. Wow. Sounds like he's playing God, doesn't he? I have a natural right to do whatever I want to do with my body. As long as it doesn't affect anybody else or any other property. Well, that's just not true. The patient decides when it's best to go. The problem with that is, is now the doctors are determining and the government is determining when it's time for you to go. And I hope you see the progression of some of this. I hate to say this, but I'll repeat it. This is him quoting Dr. Kevorkian. After death, all we know that you do is stink. Yes, we need euthanasia for certain cases where people are in comas are too immobile to even press a button. They could never, it, this could never be a crime in any society which deemed himself enlightened. like 
do not like this one, but this is what he said. I have no regrets, none whatsoever. I don't think he'll have that statement when he stands before God. He has no regrets because he has no conscience. He seared it somewhere along the line of his life. Well, the ACA, more commonly known as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, and its death panels on what treatment you will or will not receive is taking us down this path to euthanasia nationally. Salem Sarah Palin states, the America I know and love is not the one in which my parents or my baby with Down syndrome will have to stand in front of Obama's death panels so his bureaucrats have, can decide based on a subjective judgment on their level of productivity in society, how, productivity, how, pro, how much productivity you have for your society, whether they are worthy of health care such a system is downright evil. Who stated the following? The state, the state must act as the guardian of a millennial future. It must put the most modern medical means in the service of this knowledge. It must declare unfit for propagation all who are in any way visible visibly sick or who have an inherit, inherited a disease and can therefore pass it on. Who said that? Hitler. One contemporary, and I don't know who he is, Michael Basie Johnson sums it up. He sums up the mindset of the enlightened thought process of our day. And I quote him, just as the unwanted pregnancy there are unwanted people in your life you should strive to abort. And such abortion is not sin, nor harm, but the eradication of a destructive fetus. Ooh. Any di different from Hitler? Do you see the progression? from abortion to euthanasia of the suffering and the age who are deemed unproductive. Do you see that? The next logical step will be to kill off those we do not like, those we do not want to hear. And guess who that will be? You, Christians. The practices and mindset of Rome and Nazi Germany have come to roost in America. It comes to a godless, self-deifying society. I hope you see that. One of the problems with our godless society is the deification of themselves. That's really where we live today. There are no absolutes. Only what I say is absolute. And uh, so we, we live in a society like that, just like Rome was that way, Greece was that way, and uh, Hitler and the Germany that he tried to create became that way. Euthanasia is just one issue on the table when we talk about the elderly. I could talk much more about the abuse and the neglect that is commonly reported in our nursing homes from verbal and sexual abuse to the full outright neglect, which once was rare, but now has become the norm. And why is it that way? It is because we live in a society that does not value life. They only value their own. In Psalm 71, the unnamed, could be David, maybe David, 
the unnamed psalmist, though certainly a senior saint psalmist, cries for help to God concerning his desperate situation, and he prays for deliverance in light of his great confidence in God, whose lifelong care for him has sustained him. He ends the psalm with a renewed resolve to praise God continually for his faithfulness to him that he has shown him throughout his long and tumultuous life. The psalm is very instructive for us, whether we are young or whether we are old. To the elderly, it breathes hope and confidence into one's soul despite present afflictions and adversity that life will bring you. To those of us who are younger, it provides us a list of reasons why we should value those of old age that God has brought them into our lives. We, we need to value them. So let's be challenged that we must value the elderly as God does and why. In, there, in Psalm 71, we see several reasons given by the psalmist of why we should value them. Number one, they possess a legacy of trusting God. Let me reread verses 1 through 13. In thee, O Lord, do I, trust, I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to, to escape. Not, cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden from, up from, my, from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. I am a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise. And with thine honor all the day, cast me not off in the time of old age, forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemy shall, my enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him, per persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me, O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and confused that are my adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. Who better to learn to trust God that whatever befalls you in your life, that he is able to deliver and sustain you than from someone who has personally gone through it and can from experience say that God is always faithful. He's always faithful. You could always trust him. That's the elderly. Their trust or the trust of the psalmist is exemplified by a rock. Do you notice? Did you catch the repeated references to a rock? Okay, verse 3, he says it twice. Uh, depends on what version you had there. For thou my strong habitation uh, is the first occurrence, and then it says at the end, for thou art my rock and my refuge. And again, in verse 7, I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Again, a rock uh, is used there. The word rock here, uh, let's turn to Psalm 32. Psalm, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 32.4. Let's look at some other references to this rock. The rock here is... Um, It has the idea of safety, okay? There's other, there's other Hebrew words for rock. You get the word masada. Everyone know what a masada is? Masada was a level rock, okay? It was a place where you could go up and same kind of idea of refuge, be safe, okay? Uh, but this word's not masada here. This is not the Gibraltar rock, which is this huge rock that's unmovable, okay? Because God is that kind of rock, right? He's unmovable. Uh, you can't you can't knock it out of the way. The kind of rock here is a, that he uses is a rock in which you can hide. Uh, Moses uses it in, Psalm, in Deuteronomy 32 and other places. Um, 
and, and the idea is a place where you can hide like a cave or a rock in which you can find shelter or care underneath a ledge, okay? When he passed, had God said, I'll pass before you in front of Moses. It's the same word used there. He was held in a cleft of the rock. Remember that? that that's the idea. Deuteronomy 32.4. Let's look at some references to this term rock. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 4. 32.4. And the Lord said on, sh- the Lord shall do unto them, oh, I got that. that's 31. 32. He is the rock, speaking of God. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. He is the rock, okay? Not a rock, he is the rock, okay? Uh, turn to uh, uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 19, verse 14. It's another occurrence of this word, Psalm 19, 14. Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, literally in Hebrew, my rock, okay, my rock and my redeemer, okay, and then Psalm 73, 26, another very familiar verse, Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the the strength or the rock of my heart and my portion forever. God is a rock. The Lord is the rock in which you and I can hide and dwell safely. The idea here is I can trust. He will care for me. He will protect me from my enemies and the storms of life. I am safe in him. Uh, The psalmist has an unwavering trust in the Lord, his rock. The question is, how did he get it? And I hope as you read the psalm, you realize how he gets it, doesn't he? Uh, He gets it, uh, and, and, you know, how how did he get it, and what is the value, what was it uh, to him, and therefore to us? He possesses this rock-solid trust because he has seen God deliver him time and time again, uh, and to protect him over and over again. He prays. And even in this psalm, he's re, he recounts in his life, I prayed and God answered. I prayed and he answered. He saved me. He delivered me. He, he has proven to me that he's faithful. I can trust him. All right? He has been troubled by the wicked and those who re, repeatedly do wrong and seek his harm. But God has always been there for him. And he will be there always for you to come to your aid. The value is that God never fails. Even now when he is old and too weak to fight anymore. You catch that verse? I can't fight the battles anymore. You know, when you're young, you could stand up against all those people, right? He said, but I'm too old. I don't have the energy to do it. I don't have the strength to do it, okay? But you know what? I'm going to rest in your strength, God to take care of me. You are my stronghold. You are my helper. Think with me. There are not too many persons that are committed to your well-being all the time for the entirety of your life. Are there? Can you name anybody? Those of us are on the sunny side of 60. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Those that they're here today, they're on the sunny side that you had in your life that you could count on every minute of every day, all right? For some of you, you still have your mom and your dad. You know that they'll always be there. You can always trust and count on them. But this man is very, very old. That's the idea of old age here. Those of the people I visit in the rest home, they don't have mom and dad anymore to care for them. And it certainly doesn't appear that the doctors or nurses or anyone really cares for them uh, moment by moment either. I know some do. I thank you for some of the nurses that are here that do actually care for them. But you know what? God has always been there for them. And he'll be there to the last breath you take. 
God is committed to a lifelong care for his saints. There was not a time from birth, he says in verses 5 and 6, to his death that God was not caring for the psalmist. Child of God, it's the same for you. You can trust him for he's faithful. When you need to, uh, a reminder, okay, by way of application, when you need a reminder to the faithfulness and trust of God, you know what? You know what you should do? You should pull up a chair or call an elderly saint, and they will remind you uh, of the faithfulness of God, the God who can, you can trust your eternity with and as well as your every day, every hour, or every trial of your life. What a tremendous resource for you and I to tap into the elderly. Uh, we'll talk nursing home a little bit later, but I love going to see Alice, okay? Uh, Malin, you can contest to this. And other saints that are old, I, remember, I love going to see Tom Wilson when he was still alive. You know, why did I go there? Because they could encourage me to just trust God. You can trust God. You can trust him for whatever befall you. What, what a tremendous resource. Tap into it. Tap into it. Isaiah 46, 3 through 4 says this, Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to your hoary hairs, will I carry you. I have made you. I will bear you. Even I will carry you. And I will deliver you. Isn't that a great verse? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Second reason. They, despite troubles, have learned to never stop praising God. I mean, we think we have troubles. Visit someone elderly who can, can't grasp anything, can't see something, can't hear it at all. Okay? But you know what? We go to that rest home every first Sunday in the month. They're praising God. And they love to sing. When we get done with four hymns, we get to the end. You want to sing another one or you want to go back to your room? No, no, let's sing another. Praise the Lord. They have a never-ending, unexhausted list of reasons to praise God for who he is and what he has done for them. The idea here of this phrase, let's read verses 14, 16 again. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. Catch that phrase there, praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine alone. And later on in the psalm, he also talks about the praise of God. Uh, this idea, this phrase in verse 14, praise thee more and more. In the Hebrew, it has the idea of I will cause to add or to increase, okay? And the psalmist is doing this. It's, I will cause to add or increase my praise for you, all right? Uh, I will do it again. If we, in, our, in our language, I will do it again and again. I will do it more and more. Have the years increased your praise of God? Or with the increase of pain, has it increased the complaining and not the praise. There are two different kinds of people as they get older, right? Those that praise God and those that complain to him. Which one are you going to be? The psalmist increases in his praise because when he thinks about God's justice for him, of his deliverances, you know what? He runs out of fingers and toes to count them. They keep piling up. They keep multiplying. And thus the praise of God does the same. God's inexhaustible mercies, mercies to us are too numerous to count, aren't they? Turn to me to Psalm 40, verse 5. David says this. And the context here is his salvation and deliverance. Psalm 40, verse 5. 
Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. When he thinks of God's works in his life. You know, the elderly, they're counting them up, right? They've seen them over and over again. That's why when you're with some elderly, you can't leave, <laughs> right? Because they keep talking about God, the, the, the good saints, right? Because they got a lot of experiences, just how wonderful God is to them. The third reason, they have a well-tempered message to share with the succeeding generations. Turn to Psalm 71, verse 17. I think this is the high point of the psalm here. Psalm 71, 17 through 21. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and the power to the everyone that is to come. The every succeeding generation is the idea there. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God, who is like unto thee? Thou hast showed me great and sore troubles, shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Proverbs 20, 29 says this, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is their gray hair, i.e. their wisdom and experience on how to live life skillfully in the sight of God. Though the elderly may seem old to some of us, why are you so old? <laughs> they may seem old to us, and they may not be able to get around physically as you and I can, okay? They have something you and I need, and that is a message. The older generation is leading the way for the new, and they should be leading the way for the new. They lead the way by their example of godly living. They lead the way in knowing and sharing the truth. The ministry of old believers is to declare God's wondrous deeds as a testimony to the faithfulness of God to younger generations. We would all do well to listen to them. We would all do well to put ourselves in a position to visit and listen to them. You know, sit around and t sitting around and talking with the elderly has been a joy of mine for nearly a quarter of a century now. When I was first went to seminary, seminary, the first place and the only place I had an opportunity to minister the word of God was at a rest home. And I, it was good that they couldn't hear <laughs> too well, right? Uh, it was a little rest home in North Wales, PA, um, and I've had a handful of them. I, I've never stopped the ministry of going to, even when I came here, I thought, well, I have too much to do. I can't do that. No, I may have too much to do, but I need to go there, okay? That, for me, that's what it, it you know, if you, you, if you understand the ministry of the elderly, you will realize that I need to go there. It's, it's for my blessing uh, that I go there. And uh, so I, I've never stopped over the years. Um, uh, you know, I go there Sundays, and uh, though I was the one that was to preach the message those Sundays, I found that I learned more valuable lessons than what I could have ever said to them from their example and uh, of their, their example of trusting and loving Christ, often amid suffering and afflictions that you and I just don't quite understand. I'd come into the rooms and I would sit bedside with them and listen to them. And they would speak about their Savior and his faithfulness to them. And it would encourage my faith. I would listen to them speak about the mistakes they've made. 
as parents and how they wish they could do some things over and over, over again in their life while they in subtle ways would charge me to be faithful to my wife and my family and remind me of the blessings and the joys of being in a local church. You know what? If you ever feel like skipping out on a Sunday, go down to the rest home and talk to one of those who long to sit here, but they can't move. They don't even have loved ones that can put them in a car and drive them up here. You know, it's, it, it's a good medicine, good medicine for you to go listen to them. Um, their example of living by faith, whether they enjoy successes or they grew through their failures, has had a tremendous impact on my life and my children's life when they would come with me. Now, they didn't come too often, okay? I don't know too many children when I go, go to rest homes, right? people sick but uh, um, you know when they did come I know they were blessed from being there but you know you don't have to just go to a nursing home to sit down with an elderly saint we have several in this church and I enjoy doing that some of my fondest memories of being here in Warriors Mark were sitting with Tom Wilson dear saint sometimes you couldn't get more than five words out of them right but the five best words you hear all week came out of his mouth and just his love and his care uh, for me there's not a better place for those of you who have young children or teens to spend a few hours a month than by the bedside or the chair side of a faithful Christian man or woman that has fought the good fight. You know, my generation needs it. The generations that come after me need it too. And they're going to need me, and they're going to need you to be faithful and to share that faith with them. For those of, uh, of you that are in the gray-haired years, your testimony and the truth that you know and live by, it needs to be passed on. We need it. The young kids, the young, young kids out here, they need it. They need you. And um, your children and your children's children, and for some of you, your children's children's children, they need you. Uh, it's not time for you to go home yet. They need you. I need you. We need you. We need your example. We need to hear the truth and what it has done and and it means to you from your own lips. You know, heaven can wait a little longer for you. It can. So share what is in your heart to us. We need to hear it. We need to hear it. We can all learn some valuable things from those that are closest to home. Number four, and closing here, their faith and their God and God's faithfulness to them shuts the mouth of the wicked. Catch these last verses as the psalm ends. I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou holy one of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. And my soul which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. The idea there is, Lord, they're brought to shut their mouths before you. If you remain true and right with God, the older and closer you get to God, will result in an overflow of joy and praise to God from you. But on the flip side, the wicked who have observed this transformation that only God can do, right? Only God can take sinners like us and and make us praise him no matter what befalls us. The wicked will see that transformation, what God and God has only done over the years to your faith and God's faithfulness to you, and they will run out of things to say over time 
against the elderly. Uh, you know, it will make them speechless. How many times they wish to see this psalmist fail and you fail. But each time God was faithful, each time they went on, he went on in his life. You know, the wicked want us to sin. They want to see us sin and fall away from God just like they are. They want to see that living for Jesus has no more benefits than living without him. But if you live faithful, every mouth shall be stopped at the glory of the Lord and his faithfulness. Live your life in, uh, to the end in such a way that it will keep their mouths shut. And they will glorify God in the day of visitation. There's great value of being old. Rejoice in it. Don't waste a day. And don't cut it one day shorter than God has set it to be. You know, there's a tremendous value for those that are in their golden years. For those that are there, what legacy will you leave to the generations that follow you? What legacy are you still building? You know, God's not done with you. These are not years to slow down. But according to God's word, the Lord here, they are golden years of your Christian life in which you can reap an abundant harvest for standing firm and being faithful and serving Christ in your life. Don't pine away. But allow the Lord to use your influence to profoundly affect the succeeding generations. For us, we've been given a precious gift of immense value, and that is the elderly in our congregation. And guess what? We're heading in that direction. It's not time to wish to bury them or to excuse them. The senior adults and saints of our church have a powerful message and have a powerful example for us to follow. We would do well to learn from them. We would do well to love them and care for them. And in doing so, we will reap a bountiful harvest ourselves. And when we near home like them, we can have a tremendous impact and legacy of faith in a great and good God that has led us all the way. And then we get to declare his wondrous works to that succeeding de generation and to his strength to that next generation, not by way of theory and not by way of theology necessarily, but because we've experienced it. And from a sincere and grateful heart, we can shout the praises of the one who saved us and carried us in his arms all the way home in his due time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, again, your truth. Thank you, Lord, for the elderly that we have. I thank you for the elderly in, in my life, and some of which are they're still gray-headed and they're still of great value in my own life. Lord, help uh, myself and, and all of us to be half uh, the kind of person they, they are in their faith, rock-solid faith in you. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of all glory and honor. Help us to value life today as we leave this place, whether it is the unborn, newly born, or those that are, Lord, nearing home. Help us to love them, to value them, and to see them of great worth in thy sight. First, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, Tim's going to come, <coughs> sing a verse or two. Please turn to hymn 424. 424, uh, we'll sing the first and third verses. <coughs> 